The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. As more than a million and a half people in Ontario go without a family doctor, Canadians training abroad say they're ready to help. Tonight, can they solve our doctor shortage? Then, has Canada let itself fall behind in scientific research and development? We'll consider that. It's Wednesday, January 18th, and that's next on The Agenda. Canada's healthcare system urgently needs highly trained, highly skilled professionals at all levels. The need for doctors is acute and growing. But with only 2,800 spots annually in this country to begin the multi-year training required to become a doctor, it's hard to see how supply meets demand. But could there be a solution in Canadians trained abroad as doctors and eager to return home to work? Let's get into this. And as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Sydney, Nova Scotia, with The Globe and Mail's Greg Mercer, whose investigative reporting shone a light on this topic, in particular uncovering the many Canadian medical students studying abroad. Also joining us in the nation's capital, Dr. Glenn Bandiera, an emergency room physician at St. Michael's Hospital and executive director of Standards and Assessment at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And Dr. Rohit Gandhi, also an ER doctor at the Hospital Montfort. And here in our studio, Dr. Lisa Salomon, an ER doctor at the Scarborough Health Network and Sinai Health, who is the Ontario Medical Association District Chair for Toronto. And it's great to have you, Dr. Salomon, back in our program here. And to our friends in Points Beyond, thank you for joining us as well. Greg, I'm going to start with you for the first couple of minutes off the top here, just because your series really shone a light on this whole issue that we're going to be discussing tonight. Give us your best guess as to how many Canadians are abroad trying to become doctors at foreign universities. Well, thanks, Steve. The best guess that we have is that there's at least several thousand. There was a study uh, about a decade ago that had the number at about 3,500. It's hard to peg exactly, but we can safely say there are several thousand Canadians as we speak who are getting medical degrees um, at, at universities outside of Canada as we speak. And why do they go there as opposed to trying to find a space in a medical school in Canada? Absolutely, yeah. These are folks who, in many cases, were frustrated because they couldn't get into a medical school in Canada. I mean, nine out of ten applicants um, are rejected for Canadian medical school because of, of capacity. There's not enough spaces. So they go abroad. Um, many times they have impeccable degrees, uh, sorry, impeccable uh, grades and, and uh, qualifications, and they would make very good physicians. So they've simply gone elsewhere. Um, and, and they're paying out of their own pocket to get that education. And that's what I wanted to confirm. It's not that they're not good enough to get into schools here. There's just no space. That's right? Yeah, it's a space issue, really. Okay. Uh, I want to bring a graph up that uh, was in your reportage, and this is it's going to compare two things. And for those listening on podcast and who can't see these two bar graphs here, we're going to compare red bars and blue bars. The red bars show a very large number of applicants that are accepted into inter international med schools, and the blue bars right beside, as we compare year over year over year, show that a very small percentage, maybe 20 or 30 percent, who are actually accepted into residency programs back here in Canada when they're done. And I guess the question that emerges from that, Greg, is why so few people getting so few spaces back here when they graduate? Well, I think it's deliberate, right? We only give about 13% of all residencies to international medical grads. Um, and the argument is, uh, that it's the system is deliberately protecting graduates of Canadian medical schools. Um, and I think the other thing that we ought to be paying attention to is, is the decline in applications from international medical grads who are increasingly seeing Canada as, as not, a, not a viable option to become a physician. So they're going elsewhere. And I think those numbers show that. And I think we ought to be concerned at a time when the competition for physicians is only uh, growing ar around the world. And one last thing before we get everybody else involved here, and that is, uh, I, I think everybody can understand why you'd want to favor Canadians trained in Canada for the f relatively few number of spots in schools here in Canada, or residency programs in Canada. But does the system not give favoritism as well to Canadians who may be trained abroad, but who, after all, are Canadian? 
Not formally, no. In the eyes of, of the system, they are all international applicants. It's they're not. The system isn't concerned whether or not they were born in Canada or were or raised in Canada or, or whatever. Um, it's it's the school that they were educated at. That's how they're they're uh, they're counted. Um, so you know, there are a lot of Canadians who would like to come home, who would like to be part of the solution to, to help with the, with physician shortages in their communities who are being blocked from doing it because there's so few residencies that are available to them. Gotcha. Okay, Greg, thanks for that background. Let's now get some reports from the front lines here. And this is, of course, a, per a particularly timely conversation. Lisa, I'll start with you. Um, you know, a woman died in, the, uh, in a hospital uh, in Nova Scotia just this past week, waiting and waiting and waiting for treatment, couldn't get in, uh, waiting for care in the ER. Uh, you sort of uh, you work in two different ERs, right? In the in the Toronto area, what's what's your firsthand experience of what you're seeing these days? Yeah, I mean that is horrible. What what happened um, out east? I mean it's it's devastating, and we could easily see how that could happen. You know, I'm fortunate in the hospitals where I work that we do our best to see patients um, as quickly as we can. But in doing so, we're using unconventional spaces. So you know, back a few years ago. Uh, Pre-COVID, we talked about hallway medicine and ending hallway medicine, and now we have waiting room medicine. You, and have, you have waiting room medicine? We have waiting room medicine. You treat patients in the waiting we, room? We treat patients in the waiting room. So our beds are often blocked in the emergency department with admitted patients. That's because there's no space to, to move them up uh, to the floors. And so in order to be able to see patients, we're offering... In, we're, uh, uh, often initially assessing them in the waiting room, which, I mean, personally, who, who likes that, right? The, the patients don't have the same privacy as a clinician. I may not be able to do a full physical exam and as much as I would like to do, but which is better, having them wait with no assessment, with no treatment, or being able to see them as quickly as possible? But it's less than optimal, you would agree? Uh, of course, it's less than optimal. But mm -hmm. once again, what happened out east, you know, is, which is devastating, you know, had she been perhaps assessed in the waiting room, you know, maybe things could have been differently. But in many places, they don't do that for various reasons, a lot of, and I don't blame people for not wanting to do that. So we do the best that we can do. And, you know, people will often complain that we, we've heard complaints about people saying, well, I was in a broom closet or I was in a storage room um, or I'm in the waiting room. And it's something we have to balance. So it's been very challenging over the last few years, that's for sure. Let's get the view from Eastern Ontario. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, what's it like at, uh, at the Montfort? Yeah, so some very similar stories to Dr. Solomon. Uh, I think we're seeing patients in the waiting room. We're overwhelmed. And, um, you know, I know the discussion is largely around physician shortages, which is certainly uh, something we need to highlight. But it's a systemic issue. Um, we're short across the entire uh, human resource spectrum in healthcare. And I think, you know, just looking at the physician shortage is a small piece of the pie. We're really missing all of the ancillary services, the support, the systemic changes that need to happen for us to move away from that waiting room medicine. Um, you know, we, we have physicians that are just burnt out, um, not able to practice that one full-time equivalency um, that you would expect that has happened in the past because of the shortages and the burdens and uh, the working conditions uh, have been become pretty difficult. So I certainly welcome um, ideas of bringing all these international graduates to help increase capacity. But until the system changes occur, I think we're, in, uh, we're gonna be in trouble for some time. Dr. Glenn Bandiero, what's the view from St. Mike's? Well, certainly it's, it's very similar. And uh, I, I always liken these various aspects of the system as a, as a bathtub. And it doesn't really matter how big the bathtub is if what's coming in is greater than what's going out, it's going to overflow eventually. Um, so these are all system issues that are predicated on adequate resources and, and throughput strategies. And I do think that uh, health human resources is important uh, as a factor in solving this. And it's not just about getting people into the system, but it's keeping them in the system and keeping them working to their full potential. And I think that's really the risk of the burnout issue that Dr. Gandhi's identified. Let me follow up with you, Glenn, because you've kind of got two hats on today. You're a doc, but you're also uh, part of the uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. You have responsibilities there. So put that hat on and tell us whether you think we need to take uh, special efforts to get Canadians who are trained overseas into our healthcare system back home, as so many of them want to be practicing back home. Well, the Royal College is a national partner and we are responsible for setting the standards for certification in all of the disciplines uh, outside of family medicine. 
and we do that in lockstep with our colleagues at the uh, College of Family Medicine, uh, College of Family Physicians of Canada, uh, as well as the College de Médecins de Québec. So it's a national uh, approach across the three certifying colleges. And we certainly recognize the potential of individuals who've trained in uh, accredited programs uh, outside of Canada. And it's important to understand that the people that are uh, eligible to enter into both residencies and into licensed practice uh, are Canadians or permanent residents. Uh, and they've got a medical degree or residency training outside of Canada. And when we put those two things together, those are the, the, the two important criteria uh, for us. So whether they're Canadian before they went to medical school or they went to medical school and then immigrated to Canada to become Canadian and then eligible for work and licensure um, is not relevant in our decision making uh, as we're focused on uh, competence and the ability to meet the expectations of uh, Canadians and give them the, the type of service that they uh, expect and deserve and have confidence in. Um, so that, that's really the we have. Okay, one more follow-up, and that is th there's no suspicion that they're somehow not as qualified as those trained in Canada, is there? No, not at all. I, our goal is really to allow all who have the competencies required to be able to demonstrate those as quickly and efficiently as possible, and, and that's the, uh, the ultimate goal that we're working towards. Okay, Lisa Salmon, do, do you know whether you work with any doctors who are foreign trained but Canadian? Oh, lots. You do? Uh, yes. Is there any diminution in their skills compared to people who are trained here? No, absolutely not. Should there be accommodation made to try to get more foreign trained docs who are Canadians into situations here in Canada? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's definitely one of the short-term solutions that we should be looking at. There are many Canadians here who have been trained abroad who are practice ready. And what we need to do um, in Ontario is to develop a practice ready assessment program, which is a short 12 week program where they have mentorship and to make sure that they meet the standards uh, that we expect here in Canada, as Dr. Bandieri said. Um, there's seven provinces in Canada Canada that already have this program and these are people who already have finished their residencies elsewhere and who have practiced in other countries as well but now are in Canada and want to practice and so I think it would be very helpful for uh, those people uh, for a practice ready assessment program to be created in Ontario and the government needs to be able to create that and fund that and in addition you know we spoke earlier about residency programs for internationally uh, medical grads so we definitely need to increase those spots for what we call IMG uh, you know people who have gone to medical school abroad and need residency as well. Rohit is this much of a subject of conversation between you and your colleagues at the Montfort? Yeah I mean I, I certainly agree with with Dr. Solomon I think the the interesting component to this is that you know, the majority of physicians are actually working in urban centers. And so although there's a shortage, and we see that especially ubiquitously across family medicine, we really have to understand that the greatest shortage is really in underserviced areas and areas where um, we have more rural populations. It's, it's sort of that inverse care law, which sort of states that the availability of good medical care really varies inversely with the need of the population served. So not only do we need to sort of identify areas of of capacity building for, for IMGs to come to Canada, but we need to find ways to sort of encourage them to practice in the areas of focus um, that are most at need, such as primary care and family medicine, but also in the areas that are underserviced, uh, where you're not really seeing uh, you know, physicians attracted or being attracted to these areas. Greg, maybe you could help us better understand what underserviced means, because I think the suspicion is people think we're talking moose and ear, but I have heard, uh, I've heard many times over the years that Alliston, which is an hour north of this studio, is an underserved area as well. So help us understand that better. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, all provinces in Canada use what we call return of service agreements. They're essentially contracts that they require um, international medical grads to sign if they get a residency here. And essentially, it's, uh, they're, they're paying back the province for the cost of their residency. That's how the, the provinces view it. And they assign them to what the provinces view as underserved communities. And those are generally, I mean, those can be places like, um, you know, Kitchener, Ontario, which, which you wouldn't generally see as underserved, but in the view uh, of the province, that's a smaller center. Um, it is a contentious issue, however. We don't require this of Canadian medical graduates. And there are, there are, Canadians who have returned home who say that these contracts are a deterrent. It's why we are losing physicians to other countries that that in the US, for instance, we don't require this uh, of, of graduates. 
Where do we lose them to the most? What countries? Uh, a lot go to the U.S. Uh, we're increasingly using, losing them to uh, Britain, to Australia, uh, to countries that have uh, cleared the pathway for them to, to work without these restrictions. Uh, in Australia, um, these contracts that assign you to underserviced um, communities are based on where you go to medical school. If you get acceptance, regardless of whether you're Australian or not, you, you agree to go to an underserviced community. If you go to a rural university, we don't do that here. We take a different approach. And for some IMGs, they say that it feels especially punitive. Hmm. Glenn, do we need to do something about that? Well, I think the needs of the various jurisdictions are, are quite unique and um, contextual to, to each province. So the licensing authorities in each province uh, take different approaches to, to provision of licenses. Um, our national approach is, is really about setting the standard for certification um, in the disciplines uh, across uh, Canada. And um, but this is a, a really vexing issue because we talk about the right number and mix and distribution and number is who's graduating from medical school The the mix is what disciplines they choose to go into, i.e. do we have enough psychiatrists, do we have enough general surgeons. But the distribution issue is where they end up practicing, and, and that is a very vexing problem uh, nationally. Uh, it's challenging enough even within provinces, um, but to have a national strategy, it's something we're working towards, but it's, it's a very complicated issue. Well, Greg, just so we understand this, let's say you're from Alliston, Ontario, and you couldn't get a spot in a Canadian med school, so you decide to go to a foreign medical school. You graduate, you do well, you want to come home to Alliston and practice, Right now, you don't have any extra dibs on, on getting back to Alliston than anybody else? If, if you're one of the lucky ones to get a residency, if you are internationally uh, educated, you are, you are assigned essentially to an underserved um, region. So you, you don't have control in those perhaps first five years of your career where you go. Um, and that's, uh, that, that, that is a problem for some physicians. And, and we do have people who, who default on those agreements. Um, so uh, it, it causes a lot of stress for those people. And uh, again, they, they, they say, why are we not requiring these kind of agreements of people whose education we subsidize? Canadian graduates, we don't re ask the same of them. It's only someone who's gone abroad to, and paid their own, uh, paid for their own education. And I think we need to ask that question. Dr. Salmon, does that make sense to you? So I don't think that's exactly the way it works from my understanding. So. Yes, for international medical graduates, when they come here, they have to do what's called a return to service and go to a underserviced area. For how long? For I believe it's five years. Okay. But it's not that they're told they have to go to this one spot in particular. I, I believe that they have the choice of any or a, a large amount of underserviced areas. And many, like you said, are fairly close to urban centers and even in urban centers. So, for example, a few years ago, if you went just north of the city to Richmond Hill um, and you were a family doctor, there was an area just east of Bathurst north of Steeles, that was considered underserviced for family doctors. So it's not necessarily, like you said, you know, really remote rural areas. There are some, you know, suburban areas that are considered underserviced as well. But when we talk about shortages and we're talking about this a potential pool of, of physicians who can help with the shortages, we need to look at the data and we need to look at which specialties are we short in, what areas do we need physicians in. So, you know, I understand why some of them may feel it's unfair, but we're, we're trying to solve a problem. And in order to solve the problem, we need to put the supply where the demand is. But presumably, they're part of the solution. These foreign trained Canadian doctors are part of multitudinous solutions here, are they not? They're part of the solution, but part of where we need these physicians. Hmm. And if we need these physicians in underserviced areas, then that's how that's going to help us solve it. And we also need to look at. Uh, we know for sure that we have a shortage of family doctors. I mean, there are over 1 million Ontarians without a family doctor. So we need to look, get more data to see what other specialties that we're short of too. We know we're short of psychiatrists. We know we have a shortage in emergency physicians. Um, and there's probably many other specialties as well. So it's important to get that data and what locations specifically that we need these physicians to serve as well. Dr. Gandhi, when, when the people who make these decisions are considering foreign trained doctors, do you think they should give preference to Canadians who are foreign trained over those who are not Canadian? 
I think uh, at the outset, that does happen. So a lot of the program directors who are in charge of making the decisions, they're looking at uh, several different factors. I think to remain equal and to sort of, uh, you know, avoid any sort of human rights issues, I think we have to sort of look at every application and treat them equally. But you do see some um, weight put on Canadian graduates. Uh, and I think that was sort of mentioned in Greg's article that the program directors have some discretion in, in better understanding whether or not a graduate can come back and, and, and sort of if there is a, a draw back to that, um, that practice location or that area where they're from, I think there is some, some level of weight that's put on that to bring them back home. Dr. Bandiera, d does your organization make attempts to shorten the, the wait times for Canadians who are foreign trained to get back into their own country and find a spot to work? We're making efforts to streamline the process for all eligible applicants. And again, I have to be careful to say that, um, you know, whether you were Canadian before you went to medical school or you became a Canadian after you went to medical school, uh, for, for us, doesn't doesn't matter. You're uh, either way, you, you have to be a Canadian or permanent resident to, to get a license and, and embark in these pathways. Um, so having said that, um, We've looked at a number of process elements to really shorten the time to assess the training that's done abroad because training is quite heterogeneous around the world and we need to make sure that it uh, does um, adhere to the expectations of Canadian society. But then we also have to make sure that people coming back are able to adapt that training to the Canadian context because they weren't trained in the Canadian context. And, and that's the process that we're embarking on right now with our practice eligibility route um, to shorten that. And we've already taken some pretty dramatic steps at the Royal College to shorten that assessment period uh, and get people into practice, usually in a supervised environment of some kind, so somebody can keep an eye on them for a period of time, uh, make sure that that transition goes smoothly and they are meeting the expectations, uh, and then eventually they uh, write our examinations and move into full practice. Uh, so we're looking at all options to, to shorten that duration for all uh, competent individuals regardless of um, of their, their training. Just so we get a better sense of what you mean, you've shortened it from what to what? One of the application steps is the assessment of training uh, that they've had elsewhere and that in the past could take anywhere from six to 18 months um, depending on the nature of the jurisdiction they're coming from. And we've removed a couple of steps in that process that can shorten it to as uh, little as uh, two to three months for that initial assessment. And then once that's done, they can become exam eligible and get a provisional license and start serving Canadians uh, until such time as they eventually do the exam and pass it and become uh, independent practitioners. Well, let's talk about the job itself for a second. Um, Lisa, you used to be a family doc. Mm -hmm. You're now an ER doc. Uh, how come you switched? So I always did both. I did family medicine and emergency medicine. Uh, and I realized, you know, there's so much administrative burden in family medicine. And that is an important thing is that we need to look at retention of family doctors too. There are so many people in, in sort of my age group who are leaving family medicine as well as 25% of family doctors in Ontario are over the age of 60. So in the next five years, we expect a lot of family physicians to retire. Dr. Tara Kieran did a study of Toronto physicians and about 450 uh, family physicians responded and 20% of them said they expect to leave family practice in the next five years. So we need to look at what, what's going on? Why are so many family doctors leaving family medicine? And I want to say, first of all, there's a lot of burnout. Why is this? There's a lot of administrative burden. People are spending 10 hours a week doing paperwork. Doctors. Doctors. Don't they have people do that for them? No, and that's what we're asking for. So we went into medicine to treat patients. We went into medicine to be doctors. And many of us feel that we're essentially doing secretarial work, making referrals. There's so much what we call electronic medical record bloat, spending so much time in front of the computer, following up on results, getting all sorts of reports, filling out forms. You say computer. I know doctors who still use fax machines. Never mind computers, right? This is still a thing. Yes, for sure, <laughs> for sure. So definitely what we need is, you know, we've been advocating for teams. So every um, Ontarian having a team of providers working together with their family doctor, all linked on the same electronic medical record so that every so that everybody can work to their full scope. Um, you know, having uh, social workers available, dietitians, uh, physiotherapists, pharmacists, and that way physicians can do what they do best and that is being a doctor. It would also be nice to have scribes. 
uh, physician assistants, people to be able to do um, a lot of the paperwork that you know we don't necessarily need to do. And you know, we've really been advocating for the government for funding for that. And I think that would really help. First of all, to people to go into family medicine and also to stay in family medicine. And I think that those things are some of the solutions. Rohit Gandhi, can I get you to build on that answer? I mean, the, the real interesting part of this is that there was 115 spots that went unmatched in 2022. And the large majority of them were family medicine. So we talk about increasing capacity, especially for IMGs, international graduates, but there was 115 spots that just went unmatched. And we really have to think why. And I think to Dr. Solomon's point, we have to find ways to get people into family medicine and to think about why that career can be better supported uh, so we can attract more people into a field that we really need. And uh, that's a, a large number. Okay, Greg Mercer, let's uh, in our last five minutes get you back in here. I know that when reporters do big takeout series as you just did, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of loath to make recommendations at the end of it. Your job is to lay the facts out there and the decision makers take from it what they will. But I presume you came away with some ideas of some conclusions that would be useful in this case. You want to share some ideas with us? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I would say that, that step one would be increasing the number of residencies for international medical graduates. Um, uh, it is certainly more cost effective and, and much faster uh, of a method to add physicians into the system than expanding uh, domestic Canadian medical school seats. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing some provinces beginning to recognize that. Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador have in recent months uh, made announcements that they're, they're adding more residencies specifically for, um, for IMGs, people who are educated abroad, let other countries bear the cost of educating these folks. And, and, and then when they're ready, they come here. It's, it's a faster, cheaper way to add qualified doctors into our system. Okay, and would you, at the same, uh, incidentally, IMGs, we keep talking IMGs, International Medical Grads, just for the acronym there. Uh, in terms of increasing residencies, do you believe that there is a need to favor Canadians for those spots over those who are not Canadian? Well, I, I think it. I think it is being done uh, informally. I think that the point was made earlier um, that the residency coordinators might look for someone who is from the community or from the province who has roots there and is more likely to be retained as a physician. Um, but certainly, you hear that argument from Canadians abroad who say we are treated no different um, when it comes to being able to compete for for residencies uh, as someone from anywhere else, right? They, they, they would like to have, um, they would like to have uh, extra avenues open to them. Okay, Dr. Bandiera, if increased residencies is part of the solution to this problem, whose job is it to make that happen? Well, uh, another previous role I had was as the uh, postgraduate dean at the University of Toronto, so I, I live this reality as well. Um, the training positions are funded by the provincial ministries of health, and they determine the, the number of spots and, and how they're allocated across both disciplines and the applicant populations. Uh, so the ministries uh, would need to step up with that capacity and, and whatever provisions they feel are, are best uh, suited to meet their uh, contextual needs. Um, there are capacity issues within schools. Even if there was funding, there, there would still be some bottlenecks in terms of training because, as people have alluded to, people are pretty, pretty stretched and pretty thin and and uh, we need people to train uh, individuals uh, when they do come. So uh, the funding is for sure the biggest issue. And uh, the, the second is training capacity. I think there's opportunities for sure there. Okay. Uh, well, the, the Minister of Health, if she were here, would say, we're already spending $70 billion a year on health care for people in Ontario. How much more would you like us to spend in order to increase the number of residency positions available? It's all, it's all a numbers game. I mean, we, we know that it takes about a million dollars to train a medical student through to graduation, and then about $100,000 a year plus salary uh, to bring a resident through the residency programs, which are usually five to seven years. So um, it, it's a pretty substantial price tag, but it all just boils down to a, to a numbers uh, game. Okay, Dr. Salomon, in our last minute here, you hopeful that any progress is going to be made on this? 
But, you know, I, we, we need to do something. We are definitely in a crisis. Um, we currently have a huge shortage, particularly in family medicine. Like I said, a million Ontar over a million Ontarians don't currently have a family physician. Uh, obviously, having a family physician is the gateway into the healthcare system. It's the foundation of the healthcare system. And this is only going to get worse in the next five years. Um, increasing spots for international medical graduates is definitely a good one of a good short-term solution, but we need long-term solutions too, as this is going to get worse in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, we definitely should be increasing medical school spots as well. And it's it's really unfortunate that we're sending um, people born in Canada to other schools in other countries to get trained and then say, okay, let's bring them back. I mean, it's kind of un-Canadian, don't you think? And they're spending three to four times the amount of money to go abroad and coming back here with huge, or having huge debts. They so are, those doctors they themselves, are. yeah. Yes, and so I would say we need to look at short-term solutions. This is part of the short-term solution, but also long-term solutions, which would also include increasing medical school spots in Canada. Gotcha. Mr. Director, can I have a four-shot, please, so I can thank all of our guests, starting here in the studio with Dr. Lisa Salomon, Scarborough Heart Health Network and Sinai Health. In the top right corner, Greg Mercer, whose work is available on the Globe website. Uh, really good investigative reporting by Greg Mercer. In the bottom left-hand corner, Dr. Rohit Gandhi, the ER doctor at the Hôpital Montfort in eastern Ontario. And in the bottom right-hand corner, Dr. Glenn Bandiera, St. Mike's, downtown Toronto. Thank you so much, everybody, for appearing on the agenda tonight. We're grateful for your time. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Thanks, Steve. Almost three years ago, Canada was late to the vaccine hunt. We discovered we didn't make them here and relied on getting vaccines from foreign suppliers. Why weren't we making them here? Good question. Canadians have long been proud of the discovery of insulin 100 years ago, just as we were proud of BlackBerry and other tech leaders that made big breakthroughs. Are we just dining out on our past glories these days? Can we do better? Let's find out with, in the nation's capital, Sarah Laframboise, a PhD student in biochemistry at the University of Ottawa. She's also co-organizer of the advocacy group and science movement, Support Our Science. In Kingston, Ontario, Dr. Stephen Archer, head of the Department of Medicine at Queen's University and a clinician scientist who directs a Canadian Institutes of Health Research lab. And here in our studio, Ivan Semenuk, science journalist at The Globe and Mail. Ivan, it's good to see you back in that chair again. It's been a long time. And to uh, Sarah and Stephen and Points Beyond, thank you for joining us tonight as well. We're going to set this discussion up just by sharing some stats which will lay out the issue that we're about to talk about. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring these up and discover why the funding pinch many graduate students are feeling is a real thing. 86% of grad students are currently experiencing stress and anxiety related to their finances. 40% of grad students struggle to pay the rent and grocery bills. A third have considered leaving academia solely because of financial concerns. 38% of PhD students leave Canada to continue their careers abroad. That's quite the brain drain. Here are some more stats about our country's scientists and researchers. If you're a master's student, $19,000. That's what you get. Minus $8,000 for tuition to the university. That leaves them with a net salary of $11,000. $23,000 is the average salary for a PhD student. Minus 8,000 tuition, leaving the average PhD student with a net salary of $15,000 a year. A postdoctoral fellow, an academic with a PhD, likely to be probably 30 years old or in their early 30s. Average pay, $45,000. Minus nearly 7,000 in taxes, leaves them with a net salary south of $40,000. Now, Sarah, you helped compile that data, so let me go to you first. What's your big takeaway from all those numbers? Yeah, and thank you for sharing that today. I think the, the story that it's showing is that we're really not creating an ecosystem in Canada that is conducive for students to continue on in Canada. Um, we're seeing students leave to other countries after their uh, PhD to do a postdoc in other countries that will pay upwards of $60,000 a year. Um, and that's an American or US dollars. So um, we're just not creating a system that is conducive to creating research and innovation in Canada right now. And I think those stats really illustrate um, exactly why that's happening. Um, and as you mentioned, the age of these students, um, these are 
are much older than undergrad students. Um, they're mid thirties, often a postdoc, um, a PhD students, mid to late twenties. Um, these are young adults who care about things like other young adults. So they're often behind many of their peers. Stephen Archer, what's your takeaway from those numbers? Yeah, the, there is definitely a problem with the payment of graduate students. And we have a vibrant uh, program here called Translational Medicine and the graduate students there get about $23,000 a year, which is not competitive. I, I think also the graduate students are paid really ultimately by their principal investigators. And when the time is right in this interview, I'm happy to share the CIHR funding rates because the money coming into our lab translates into what we can pay scientists, including graduate students, and there's just not enough of that money coming in. Ivan, why do you think that is? Well, Canada historically has uh, underperformed as uh, in, in the total amount that it allocates to science. So just to kind of put it in a global perspective, you know, if we look across OECD countries, there's a metric called research intensity. It's how much of your GDP is put towards research and development. The average for developed countries is about 2.6% of GB GDP, maybe 2.7. Canada is consistently under 2%, about 1.8 or so. Now, now, 20 years ago, it was a lot closer. Uh, we've sort of flatlined all through that time where globally the investment in research has increased. So, you know, it just, we are falling behind in that way. Well, play that out. What are the mm -hmm. consequences of continuing to fall behind in your view? I think the consequence, some of them are that uh, we don't have a place uh, for, for our own scientists that we train. They have to go abroad. I think it's deeper, though. It means that there are fewer people, people working on scientific issues that might be especially relevant to Canada. Uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, not contributing to um, uh, an environment or a community where we have a lot more uh, highly qualified people in the country. You know, they have to, to go abroad to, to see those, uh, to find those jobs. And I think there's a deeper issue, too, which is what is Canada's role in the world? You know, science is a kind of combination of uh, a collective work, like everyone's working together to find the answers, vaccines, cures, discoveries, but it's also competitive, you know, from an economic basis, even an individual basis. That's how humans operate, right? <clears throat> Groups of people cooperate and, and compete. Uh, so what is Canada's contribution to this if we're kind of not really uh, putting in our two cents enough, and instead we're putting in our 1.8 cents, <laughs> and, uh, and it, it kind of raises a question about our role in the world. Stephen, let me tap into a bit of your background here, because I think, if memory serves, you, you, you did some of your research in Chicago once upon a time? Yes, yeah, I've been on both sides of the border, about half in Canada and half in the United States. I mean, I think what's important to recognize, getting to Ivan's comments, is that our, most of the money for research in Canada comes from CIHR. And it used to be that CIHR funded 31 or so percent of all the grants that were submitted to it. These are the project grants that actually pay for the scientists and the graduate students and the materials to do research. Now it funds 18 to 20 percent. So there's been a marked fall off in the success rate. And most labs like mine require about three grants to run. So we're continuously writing grants to try to get this money. So to keep me my half million dollar payroll, I have to have three grants at any one time. The success of any grant, even at my stage in career, let alone a junior investigator, is only 18 percent. So, for example, my last successful grant, I submitted three times before it was funded, and yet I'm an acknowledged leader in that field in the world. Uh, and when the money comes in, the problems don't stop. And again, I'm not criticizing CHR, and I think many people are afraid to speak out for being perceived as being disloyal. But I think the truth needs to out. And the reality is once you get your grant after your second or third try, the budget is cut 23.5% automatically across the top. So you don't actually have enough money to do what you propose to do in the grant. And then the other place that we go, and I'll stop with this, uh, is, is CFI, which is a wonderful organization, that the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, and they give us money for large infrastructure, but what they don't fund are the scientists to run that infrastructure. So I have several proposals that I'm happy to speak about, if you wish, for how we could change CIHR funding and how we could change CFI funding to stabilize things. And spoiler alert, the Naylor report that came out in 2017 spelled it out, and part of the problem is $1.4 billion more in spending on Canadians. Well, just before we go, okay, before we go there to your ideas, I, I want to draw on the Chicago experience. What was it like when you were in Chicago? 
So I'm in Canada. I'm Canadian. I love Canada. So my, my responses are not a criticism of Canada. But for example, when I was recruited to be chief of cardiology at University of Chicago, I was offered $15 million as a startup package to recruit scientists and fund my own lab. Uh, I was offered $1 million at Queen's University to start my own lab, and half of that was spent renovating my lab. I chose to come here because my values as a cardiologist and head of medicine are more aligned to the Canadian values of universal access to health care. Uh, but definitely, Dr. Richard Resnick, who recruited me, offered me the chance to apply for a Canada research chair, and I knew I could apply for CIHR funding. So those were two big inducements to come back to a more humane health care system. Gotcha. But that's been eroded. Hmm. All right, Sarah, um, normally we don't ask people a lot of personal financial questions on this program, but you are here, and this is the story. So if you don't mind, uh, let's just sort of... Um, pull the curtain back a bit and find out about your uh, educational financial journey. Um, I'm guessing you did, Absolutely. where'd you do your undergrad? I went to York University. So I did an undergraduate in biology and then moved to the University of Ottawa to start my master's uh, in 2018 and then transferred to my PhD in 2020. Um, so yeah, I've been, this is now my 11th year of <laughs> post-secondary education, which seems a little crazy, but um, along that time, I have self-funded most of my education. Um, that means taking out grants like OSAP. Um, at the moment, I'm sitting at over $100,000 in student debt, um, and that's 11 years of paying tuition. Um, when I started my master's degree, I was making about $19,000 a year. Um, and then moving on to my PhD, um, I about two years ago got an NSERC uh, CGS award, which now is about 35,000. So um, I'm now in a better financial situation than I was, but I mean, 35,000 still is barely enough to cover most of my monthly expenses. You no, know, 35,000 is uh, to be sure. And, and the kind of situation you find yourself in, I gather you can't really be moonlighting at a bodega or something like that to try to <laughs> get a little extra money on the side. Do I have that right? No, oh, yeah, and actually there's a lot of restrictions in place that don't allow students to work outside of their studies. So if you do get one of these tri-council scholarships or a lot of universities will regulate this 10-hour rule, which stops students from working more than 10 hours outside of their studies. Um, so, I mean, I've pushed the limits of that probably throughout my degree, mostly out of necessity. Um, in the last 11 years, I've worked probably upwards of 15 jobs uh, just to make ends meet. I've always been kind of a self-starter that way. So you're, you're clearly um, ambitious enough to want to get this done. I don't have to tell you what the stats are on PhD students eventually being able to get the jobs that they want to get at the end of the day. You think you're going to make it? <laughs> I hope so. Um, I think that's probably the most daunting kind of aspect of all of this is being so close and seeing all of these stats. Um, it is definitely discouraging. Um, in my mind, it, it's mostly troublesome when I think about future students coming up through the system will have it worse off than me if things don't change with inflation increasing at the rate that it is. It's only going to get worse. So um, I often worry about what the system is kind of making this certain type of person that is able to pursue this type of education and financially can take on all of these types of burdens. Understood. Well, it's not like we don't have a history of science excellence in this country. I mean, we mentioned a few of them off the top. The discovery of insulin 100 years ago, the Canadarm, which uh, people of a certain age will remember, Northern Telecom, BlackBerry. We've had our champions in those fields. Ivan, let me bring you back in here. Compared to how the United States does stuff, how do they monetize their discoveries differently from the way we do? One of the big differences, uh, both between Canada and the U.S. and also some other uh, developed countries, Japan and Germany, for example, is uh, there's comparatively less uh, investment in research and development from the business community, uh, you know, sorry, from, from the business sector. Uh, it's, it's sometimes called BIRD, this, this amount uh, of funding that would come for research from the business side versus, you know, public funding or higher education. So that's a bit of a, of a gap that Canada struggles to fill. It means that public funding from the government has to try to fill that gap. That's one of the reasons why, why it's lower. I think there are other reasons too. You know, we are, uh, there, there, you know, there is a bit of a branch plant uh, effect here in Canada. You know, the big multinationals that are uh, major contributors to research often head offices are in the uh, U.S. or in Europe or in other areas. Uh, less of that kind of primary research is being funded in Canada from those companies. So that's part of the reason. Hmm. I also think, though, that there is a cultural difference. In the U.S., science is seen as strategic. 
it's centrally important to the U.S. and its, its role in the world. And I think here in Canada, one thing, I, I've covered a lot of science in the U.S. I was a bureau chief in Washington for Nature and also in Boston for New Scientist. And the sense of critical mass and speed, it's like Dr. Archer was saying, Canada's wonderful, but when you step into the U.S. research community, you sort of, it's, all, it's like stepping onto one of those walking sidewalks that everything <laughs> seems to be moving faster. Um, and, and you have a sense that that uh, people are keeping an eye on it. In addition to the, the funders, you know, the governments or others that are giving the money for the research and the researchers who are receiving the funding, there's kind of a third leg of the stool, think tanks, policy groups, strategizers, people who are analyzing all of this and trying to say, like, how do we optimize this? I think in Canada, that third part is missing. There's not, not as much... Um, um, critical mass of people who are watching this whole process. Well, let me get Stephen Archer on that. Is the monetization of scientific discoveries something that you think is encouraged uh, in academia in this country? Uh, not as much as it should be. And I, I just add on top of what Ivan said, NIH gets $39 billion a year. CIHR has $1.4 billion. So we're only one-tenth the size of the United States. So we're severely financially disadvantaged in terms of federal investment. And on the business side, you know, my lab has several patents for different mitochondrial therapeutics. And it's, there is a branch plant mentality. The people you're talking to in Canada don't run these international drug companies. They are branches of it. And so there's not a lot of either philanthropy or business investment in this. And so I think this is where CIHR's role is really critical in funding science. And it is hard to get money for commercialization. There's a lot of barriers to that. And, and the one thing that listeners may not appreciate is just that when you talk about scientists, you might think of some geek like myself who's working on how mitochondria divide and move in cells. But this geek day job is to be a cardiologist. I'm going this afternoon to see cardiology patients in my clinic. I run the Department of Medicine. I build a translational research center. And that's true for most of my colleagues across the country. So every nickel that CIHR or CFI put out really comes back to the government of Canada as income tax, sales tax, and the spin-off benefits that people are more aware of, which is good science and patents and new products. So I think it's really the best investment you could possibly make. I and mean, that's what the NALA report highlighted, was you get great value for this money. The more you spend, the more benefit you get. We should just do a follow-up on that. Uh, Naylor report is the David Naylor report. He was the former president of the University of Toronto who did a report, I guess, five or six years ago, something like that. Ivan, what was the mission behind that report? This was a landmark document. Uh, so when the Trudeau government came in in 2015, you know, they came in on kind of restoring science to its rightful place. There's a lot of politics there because of uh, the, the image that the Harper government, the outgoing Harper government had with respect to science, especially environmental science and government scientists. Uh, although, you know, truth be told, the actual funding uh, for research is pretty similar across the two governments. Anyway, the idea was, let's do an overhaul. Let's take a whole a look at the entire research infrastructure. David Naylor was uh, the chair of this committee that did that. They really went in deep. They did uh, very extensive interviews across the country. The panel produced this report with several recommendations. Were they followed up on? Uh, some, uh, and many would say not enough. Of course, part of the recommendation was the whole ecosystem just needs more support. It, it needs more, you know, m more money going in. But there are other recommendations about the way that money could be distributed, and some of that has been debated over. Uh, and some of the recommendations have been taken on board in some ways. Things have evolved. <laughs> but I would say two areas that the report pointed out that are worth thinking about, and these are disproportionately affected when you don't have enough funding, is noting that a lot of the big discoveries tend to come from high-risk, high-reward kind of research. You know, Let's give this a shot. We don't know if it's going to work. Let's try it. Uh, and also from cross-disciplinary research where researchers from different disciplines come together in unusual ways or perhaps working with outside, like, you know, uh, international ex expertise, mm -hmm. kind of putting together unusual partnerships and something comes out of it. When funding is tight, you know, people become more risk averse. Take fewer risks, yeah, and, sure. and so then it becomes like, well, let's just play it safe. Mm. Sarah, I want to uh, tap into your knowledge as uh, one of the very few people in this country, I'm sure, who had the opportunity to testify before a parliamentary committee, which you did. Uh, Kirsty Duncan, the Etobicoke North MP, former science minister, was the chair of that committee. What did you tell her? <laughs> yeah, I shared a lot of the same stats that we talked about today, which is exciting. 
Um, the response that we got from the standing committee was positive. A lot of the MPs were concerned about the, some of the stats that we were bringing up in the in the committee, but um, I was quite disappointed once we got to see the report for the committee come out for the um, the study that I appeared for. Um, we were asking for about 48% increase in the graduate student scholarships uh, to adjust for inflation over the last 20 years since they've changed the last time. Uh, but the committee came out and suggested a 25% increase in the in the scholarships, um, which I think puts us in, I think, 2015 numbers, which still puts us way far behind. Um, another point of that is we were really talking about the idea of adjusting these awards to inflation. Um, this was something that was done in Australia, for example, where they continue to adjust awards uh, granted to graduate students and postdocs over the course of, of years so that they, we don't get to the situation years down the line. Um, but yeah, that, that part seems to be up for debate with some MPs and, and yeah, maybe they're not so in favor of that part of it. Well, ultimately, of course, it's not those MPs who make the decision. It's the finance minister who makes the decision. Do, do you feel you got a fair hearing and that they at least get what you're trying to say? I think they get what we're trying to say. I think obviously the the fiscal reality of Canada right now is that when the budget comes in the spring, we're not in a in a situation where we can provide these big investments that science I think require at the moment. So the biggest thing that we're trying to push at the moment is the significance and the urgency of the of the matter and try to put it into the the frame of, of what this impact is long term. Um, but yeah, I think at the moment, there's just so many other things going on in, in Canada's economic reality that it's hard for us to make this case. Well, let me hit, hit on this with Stephen Archer, because you know, I can imagine people are watching this right now saying, OK, so a bunch of PhD students aren't getting as much money as they want. Big deal. Who cares? And I, I guess the reason who cares is that when a global pandemic hits and you're a country that needs vaccines and you don't make any vaccines anymore, that's a problem, and you're at the end of the line around the world in terms of getting access to life-saving vaccines. Can you talk to us about how, Dr. Archer, how did we get to a point where we are just so scientifically apparently dependent on so many others when 100 years ago we might have been at the forefront of so much of this? It's an interesting question. I just would also just add to Sarah's comments that in fact, Let's Talk Science is a group that looks at graduate students, and they've plotted that the numbers of Canadian students going into science is completely flat. The only reason we're not falling precipitously is because of international students coming to Canada. That's where our science is coming from. So why does it matter? I'll tell you, and everyone that knows me or that listens to this will laugh. I'm way too liberal to live in the United States, and I'm way too aggressive to live in Canada. So I, I need to sit on the border somewhere, and probably in a padded suit. And I think the answer is complacency. Canadians are complacent. We're one of the few people that are content with a bronze medal, and we're content to have pretty good science. And not for like hockey. To be nice and polite. Not for hockey, yeah, Stephen Archer. Hockey. We want gold in hockey, but yeah. everything else bronze, eh? Uh, my league is called the Leftovers. I proudly play every Wednesday and Sunday, but except for hockey. We are diverted. And one of the things the Naylor report highlighted was the fact the government is interfering, for want of a better term, in science. So they proposed that an independent scientific committee, not bureaucrats, but scientists, be used to advise science on big investments, uh, CHR and other agencies on big investments. Um, and so I think it, it is important to recognize that we're just not ambitious enough and we're not creating jobs. And that's partly. The, you know, when uh, graduate students like Dr. future Dr. Laframboise are uh, done, people like me are hiring them. I can't hire them if I don't have money. I don't get money if I can't get CIHR grants. And CIHR is simply underfunded by one point some billion dollars. So if we invested that money, she'd have a job. I'd have a bright graduate student who, like many graduate students in my lab, go on to become faculty members. They teach our university students. They invent things. And so complacency is what allows us to just sit put and uh, watch ourselves stagnate behind other countries. And um, I, I think it would be a fairly simple fix to change the funding model at CHR. So, for example, one of the problems, like I'm going to get notice on two grants today, they will probably be rejected, even though in theory I'm a world leader in these fields. I will have to write them two more times before they get funded. We used to have something called foundation grants. Foundation grants took all my ideas, so I have three or four big ideas in my lab, bundled them all together. I was funded at a rate of about $3 million for seven years, so I wasn't constantly churning and applying. They were The foundation grant program was reviewed, and it was positive. The review was never released. 
and the program was terminated. And I think the belief was we needed not a bunch of old fat cats like me, but a bunch of young people doing science. But it's an ecosystem where you need tall trees and small trees, and there's no point funding young investigators if old investigators are out the back door. So bringing back the foundation grant and increasing the funding envelope while paying graduate students more and having CFI fund people to operate infrastructure platforms would counteract the complacency that has crept into Canadian science, and it would make us competitive with the United States. Understood. we got about a minute and change left here, Ivan, and I wonder whether, how do we get more business money into the system as well? Uh, I, well, I, that's maybe the, the wicked problem because that has to do with how our, uh, you know, how the economy is set up. We still have a very resource intensive economy. <laughs> maybe that will change as we get to things like, uh, you know, new ways of getting to energy, uh, you know, other, other ways of uh, uh, kind of using our resources. I, I think though, still there at the bottom of all of this, there's a culture issue. I just want to point out in addition to the Naylor report a few years ago, the Council of Canadian Academies put out a report looking at Canadian Canadian attitudes to science. The bottom line was Canadians overall are very positive about science, maybe even more than other countries that invest more. But the, I, th I think the telling uh, detail in that was fewer Canadians see themselves, see science as essential to their lives. In, in other words, to their jobs or to their livelihoods. They like watching the nature show on TV. They like going to the science center, but they don't see it as central to their life. And, and they think, need to. And we need to. We should be having this conversation at least once a year, I think. Okay. Same time next year. You bet. <laughs> All right. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Sarah Lefwambois, the PhD student in biochemistry at the University of Ottawa. Sarah. I hope you graduate. I hope you get a fantastic job and you invent the cure to something. So well done. Stephen Archer, uh, head of the Department of Medicine at Queen's University. Ivan Semenik, whom you read in the Globe and Mail, their longtime science journalist there. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is the agenda for Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Tomorrow, could layoffs in the tech sector turn out to be a blessing in disguise? We'll explore that. Also, we'll check in on what enabled some high-profile cybersecurity breaches in our province. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.